Aimpoint Hunts the Globe 3 is proudly presented by Aimpoint. Also brought to you by Beretta Australia, distributors of Sarko, Sarko Cartridges, Tika and Sportier. Hello and welcome. My name is Rob Fickling and I'm the presenter of the Australian hunting TV series Beyond the Divide. I'll be your host for this adventure as I join our guests from Aimpoint Sweden, the former world's strongest man Magnus Samuelsson, his brother Torbjorn and Aimpoint's international marketing director Eric Jepsen. For experienced hunters Magnus, Torbjorn and Eric, this will be their first trip hunting down under and I can assure you they're in for an exciting surprise as we journey on a hunt that spans the entire continent. Australia is made up of an extremely diverse landscape, featuring dry deserts, mountain ranges, snow-capped peaks and tropical rainforests. The hunting here is focused around our six introduced deer species, as well as multiple feral animals that present year-round opportunities with no bag limits. Over the next 14 days, we'll be focusing on samba deer in my southern home state of Victoria before moving on to the top end to hunt everything that the Northern Territory is famous for in feral pigs, water buffalo and banteng. Here in Australia, our premier big game species are the mighty samba deer that inhabit the thick, steep forests of Victoria's Great Dividing Range. For the first leg of this trip, we're starting our hunt in the heart of traditional samba country, just near the town of Eildon, three hours north of Melbourne. Released into Australia back in the 1860s, Samba are native to India and much of Southern Asia. However, the climate and habitat of the Victorian high country has suited them perfectly and they've thrived in the Australian bush with little impact to the environment. Here in Victoria, Samba deer are predominantly hunted using two methods, stalking or over scent trailing hounds. Hunting over hounds is often a fast paced and exciting hunt and it's very much a part of Australian hunting culture and local resident Paul Bogue and his family have three generations of proud hound hunting tradition. We'd be joining the Bogue's hound crew for three days and their team of houndsmen have decades of combined experience successfully hunting many trophy samba stags throughout the Victorian high country. A typical hunt first involves tracking out fresh deer sign, then once fresh spore or marks are found and deemed to be suitable to hunt, the hounds are walked in and released. If the marks are hot, the hounds will voice and pursue the deer. From then on, it's up to the houndsmen to use their experience to set up an ambush in locations that they think the deer might run. The areas hunted are vast tracts of public forest and the terrain is steep and the bush is thick. If the chance of a shot arises, it's nearly always at close range on a running target. So the use of red dot sights are extremely valuable and it's why they are the number one choice of hound hunters in Australia. With the environment often being as big a challenge as the deer, a site that is rugged in construction and built from quality components is very important, which makes Aimpoint the ideal choice for this hunt. With a dedication to innovation and performance in both hunting and military fields, Aimpoint has over 40 years tradition manufacturing red dot sites, and with the proud innovator of the original red dot reflex site back in 1975. Over the last four decades, Aimpoint have continually led the market with their uncompromising dedication to product development and innovation, which culminated with the release of the Aimpoint Micro H2 in 2015. This little site is the lightest and most high performance site ever built by Aimpoint. It's just 70 millimetres long and weighs only 105 grams. A crucial aspect and design feature of the Aimpoint Micro site is that they're designed to be used with both eyes open. This is made very easy by the fact that there's zero magnification, so there's no difference between your left eye and your right eye when you bring up your rifle, which makes acquiring your target extremely fast. A feature that is unique only to Aimpoint and the secret to the accuracy of this sight is that the red dot is positioned on a special double lens system, so there's zero fault in the parallax. With magnified rifle scopes, which are what most hunters are familiar with, the reticle must be centred in the tube for accurate shooting. This is because those sights have varying degrees of parallax. The presence of parallax in a sight basically means that if the reticle is viewed from different angles, the point of aim will move around on the target even when the weapon is not moving. 
In simple terms, when using an aim point, wherever the dot appears is the exact point of aim. This means you've got a little bit of play when you bring up your rifle. Again, making for lightning fast target acquisition because you're not having to get as strictly set on the comb of the stock as you would with a traditional magnified scope, which gives you those extra few seconds of valuable time to get in an accurate shot. The unit is extremely strong and built to military spec, and these sites are the only ones that are tested to work at temperatures from minus 45 to 71 degrees Celsius, and they can be submerged down to 45 meters. The battery life in here is an amazing five years, and it features an adjustable intensity dial to change the brightness and crispness of the red dot. As we head off into the Victorian hills chasing Samba, then north up into the territory stalking big game, I'm proud to say that Aimpoint sights will be fitted to all of our rifles, from the Ticker CTR in 308, right up to the Sarko Brown Bear in 450 Rigby. The Victorian mountains had turned on a beautiful morning for the start of our Samba hunt and it was action stations at base camp at the Bogues Hound Crew. Paul's brother Adam was away well before dawn to make his way to the top of the mountain to begin tracking out sign at first light and hopefully find a fresh start for the hounds. Once all our gear was sorted, we split up into teams and began to head off into the forest to get set up and into position. Magnus, it's been a big build up for you, mate. We're finally in the hunt in Australia. <laughs> yeah, finally. Does it feel good? It feels very good. I um, uh, heard so many good stories about it. So yeah, I'm, no I'm shortage of stories excited. around the hound camp last <laughs> night. <laughs> I want you to smell something, mate. This is, uh, stay there. This is a gum tree, eucalyptus. Mm. You smell that? Nice. That's the Australian bush, so, you know, that's what we used to. We kind of take it for granted, don't we, we mate? We certainly do. Yeah. <laughs> it's a complicated, and simple beast at the same time, isn't it? Hound hunting. Very much. So. Um, we've got uh, we've got multiple guys stationed over the range here behind us. Uh, we've got sort of blockers. We've got stoppers. We're trying to get the aim point boys in the line of fire. But being wild deer and being dogs in the situations could go anywhere. But Paul, with your experience, mate, give us a quick rundown on how you've set up this hunt, why we're here, yep. and how you think it's going to run if it unfolds as planned. If it unfolds as planned, the boys are up the top, about two and a half k's from us here on the mm -hmm. top. Now, have they started a deer yet or not? Um, yeah, they've just gone into starting now. So right. start him now, and he's taking off running parallel with us, and he's mm -hmm. got to decide which side he wants to fall off the top of that mountain. And hopefully it's this side. If he comes this side, the big basin above us funnels everything down to sort of here. Yep. So they end up down in one or two little spots here. Now the voicing of the hounds is such an exciting component. You know, you, coming from Europe, you've grown up with it. It's what you know. But a lot of Australian hunters uh, aren't used to so much the hound hunting scene. But if all goes to plan today, we'll capture you know the the excitement, the adrenaline of just what it sounds like when these dogs are in full voice. Mm. So they they're voicing now on the other side of the range. Is that right? The, yeah, the moment they're them. yeah just yep. on the other side. Okay. Saying it's a flat plateau and they're just on the back side of it at the moment, mm -hmm. waiting to hopefully they'll turn and come our direction. So we can see them on the on the um, on the tracker okay. and we're keeping in touch with them on the radio. It's pretty much just a waiting game, yeah? Yeah, pretty much so. Waiting game. If they come this way, we're right in the middle of the action. If they go the other way, unfortunately. Now we've got uh, your brother is just down the road here. Yeah, He's to be just, honest, just, just down to just, our left. Yeah. Yep. Yep. And where's Eric at the moment? Eric's back the next spot just back okay. behind us. Yep, so we're all on this side of the range. We're all on this side. So at the moment the deer <laughs> He's not playing the game and gone the other side, but we'll wait and see. And uh, how long do you reckon we'll give it here before you might make a move? If it commits properly to the other side, the boys at the top tell me it's committed down the opposite side, yep. then we'll make the move. Until it All commits, right. it could easily come this way. And All if right. it comes this way, we've got to be here because we are the main spots on this side. Sounds good. Well, if we get a deer coming this way, Magnus is first up on the shot. You've got a ticker there. Yeah, I should do a ticker you... today with 300 wind mag. Uh -huh. uh, mounted a... Aim point hunter on it. This is ideal for this kind of terrain. Yep, close Looking, range, swing it through. Moving target, yeah. And what do you think the distances will be here, Paul? 50 metres and less, most of it. 50 metres and less. Nice and close, nice and loud. Nice and close, yeah. Either side of us and safely in position throughout the nearby gullies, Torbjorn had teamed up with Les and Eric was in the good hands of Sam. After a solid stint of waiting for the action to come our way, it seemed that for now, the deer were planning on running the other side of the mountain. Paul's just saying the deer aren't playing the game, they're still just hanging on the top of this ridge over the backside. 
Not playing our side. No. You have got shooters down the got, bottom. I've got shooters on, yeah. on the other side if they hit, if they fall the other fall. Yep. But there we can't. It's, one of them can't leave it because if they yeah. decide to come here, they're here very quickly. Yeah, it could be on. Yeah. The ridge is probably about six, six, eight hundred metres up here to my right. Paul decided it was time to make a move towards his brother Adam, who was staying close to the hunt. Adam was able to keep up with the hounds, and once we met up with him, we started to move in on what was looking like a very exciting opportunity for Magnus. The hunt is on, and boy do I mean on. That deer and the dogs were staying on the other side of the mountain, so we've made a move, and we are right in the hunt. This is probably the most idyllic situation we could hope for, and that the dogs have bailed a stag down here. Magnus has had a a crash course in the Victorian bush and it's down through the thick stuff and through the blackberries but if I turn the camera down and face down here you'll hear the hounds it's a pretty awesome feeling when you hear those hounds voicing and you know that they're voicing on a good stag the boy's got a quick glimpse at it this morning and it is a mature animal okay boys we've got the ideal scenario out here mate you've got a bale what we all have our fingers crossed and hope for Take us through what's going to happen, Adam. All right, we're just going to sneak down here a bit more to the left because the breeze is coming across us. We'll get down and we'll just drop on top of them. We'll get you a shot down here. How far you reckon away they are? Oh, 100 metres. If that, yep. Yeah. And they're tucked in the bottom of that gully. Yeah, we've been here for about half an hour or more. We believe it's going to be... Fingers crossed. Okay, good luck, mate. It's going to happen. It's going to make I'll, I'll, hang, I'll hang out here if he leaves. So I'll give eyes on him if he sneaks out on us. Sounds yeah. good. Yeah, that's that's go time. Let's go. Uh, with the hounds in full voice below us and our adrenaline pumping, we started on the final approach, but as we neared the bottom of the gully, we saw a flash of antler through the scrub and the hounds took off around the next spur. Unfortunately, boys, I think he broke bail. Another member of the crew was covering the next gully, so we eagerly moved in to check out the result and found some very happy hounds with a happy hunter and a great trophy. As Snipe here admires his work on this beautiful Samba stag taken by the boss, Paul Senior. Congratulations, Thanks, mate. We had the ideal scenario there, didn't we, guys? Almost, but these guys don't play the game. Yeah, just as we were sneaking in, we probably got about, I don't know, 60, 80 yards. We broke bar, we left the run up the side of the hill and come down to the person coming up from underneath and got shot. But the ideal scenario here is played out that, you know, we've got, you got, you had guys positioned backing up, you know, this country yeah, yeah. like the back of the hand, you know what to do. So the, 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 uh, the stag didn't get away, the dogs have got their reward. And Magnus, what do you think seeing one of these in the flesh? Very beautiful animal, and they're way bigger than they expected them. Yeah, <laughs> we've been talking up how big they are, but until yeah. you see one in the flesh, yeah. And, uh, to, to see them move around in this, in this terrain, because it's, I tried it, it's pretty hard to move around in this <laughs> What about that scrub? <laughs> we gave them a dose of the uh, Victoria's finest, the blackberries, the, uh, the scrub, the dogwood, everything. Snipe here, the bloodhound's done his job. We've got Raph, Raph and Wazza, Wazza the, back. the two Harriers. We've still got some great opportunities around here today. What's happening in the rest of the hunt and the bigger picture at the moment? Well, the other two dogs that split off from these five, they've shot that little stag right. back up the top where we started. Yep, so we've got another animal down, which yep. is great. Uh, little Andy shot that one, so uh -huh. we'll head back up there. We've got another mark dropping down off the road to where we were set up this morning. We'll go and see if we can crank that up. And 10.30, two deer down, and you've seen your first big stag. I think we've started pretty well. <laughs> Back on the other side of the mountain, it had turned out to be a quiet morning for Eric and Torbjorn. As all the action had moved well away from their positions, they took some time to warm up by the fire and were kept well entertained exchanging stories with the rest of the crew from previous hunts on both sides of the equator. Things weren't staying quiet for long though, as Paul had a new set of marks and the hounds were back onto the samba. The dogs have decided to air send or wind send something down there. You boys at the bottom all ready to go? All right, we'll let them go now. Try to go then, Gags. We're just tipping them in, hoping they'll, they'll find it. By mid-afternoon, it started to get exciting for Les and Torbjorn, as the hounds could be heard voicing hard and coming their way. They moved to get into the clear and were at the ready, but as luck would have it, the deer turned and climbed, 
and another member of the crew was able to cleanly shoot the deer before it escaped back over the high ridge. The small stag was in a very steep spot for retrieval and with the aid of a winch the whole animal could be hauled back up the steep face and loaded into the vehicle. With the light starting to fade and evening approaching, Eric was in with a chance. The hounds were in top gear and he and Sam worked hard to get ahead of them, but the deer were just too cunning and they stayed in the cover, using their other escape routes to cleverly evade the hunters. As evening fell at the end of day one, even though they'd had a couple of slim chances, the elusive Sam Badir were living up to their name and none of the Aimpoint boys were able to get one in their sights. Despite this, they'd still all had an exciting day and a fantastic introduction to Samba hunting over hounds. With another huge day ahead, we were certainly all looking forward to the possibilities that tomorrow could bring. For our hunt on the second day, the crew had relocated deeper into the bush and from before first light, camp was a hive of activity as everyone prepared for a big day. The weather had turned on another beautiful Victorian winter morning with clear skies all around. And as the sun topped the ridges, we set off on the walk into the bush. Big start to our second morning here. We're throwing all man, animal resources out that we can. So the famous Taponga Valley, up in the state forest around Big River. And we've got all the crews heading in above us to the higher country, ready to track out for sign and get the dogs rolling. And we're coming in down low in a classic flush hunt with the shooters down low in the valleys and the deer starting up high and making their way down this thicker, kind of scrubby country that you get in these valley floors. So walking the boys in, we've got two crews here, we're gonna split up and set, wait maybe about half an hour for the crews to get up above us here and tip the dogs in on fresh sign. Hopefully that voicing starts straight away, which is what you want to hear as a shooter, and then just wait for the action to unfold. Paul and Adam had a solid plan in place, and our three teams of shooters were to be put into position along the valley floor at key points where they had previously known the deer to travel. Eric and Sam would be at the lower end of the valley, Les and Torbjorn would be in the middle, and Paul, Magnus and I would be furthest up. At the head of the valley, Adam had driven to the ridge to walk in the hounds and begin searching for fresh sign. And it wouldn't be long before he marked a start and the hounds were away, headed roughly in our direction. For us, positioned throughout the valley floor, the waiting game had now started again. The bush was quiet, the radio was quiet, and we patiently waited, straining to hear the slightest sound that might indicate that things were going to heat up. It took some time before it started to look and sound like the hounds were coming our way, and what began to unfold was an exciting but frustrating chain of events that would plague us all morning, but in essence is the honest reality of hunting Samba over hounds. Paul's years of experience and gut instincts told him that the small clearing that we were holding off was the place to be, but for today, the deer just didn't want to come near it. And on multiple occasions, they ran past us, above us, behind us and opposite, but never in front of us. Unfortunately, the same scenario was playing out for Eric and Torbjorn, but they weren't complaining. After a quiet day yesterday, today they were right in amongst it, with the hounds roaring towards them a number of times and even getting glimpses of the deer. But still, they couldn't get a chance for a clear shot. Mid-morning, the hounds were in full voice, pursuing a samba back down the valley. Torbjorn got a glimpse of the deer and prepared for a shot but it quickly vanished into the safety of the thick scrub. After multiple close calls and adrenaline charged encounters between all of us, the hounds came Torbjorn's way again. And this time he was in a great position and finally got eyes on the elusive Samba as it ran the riverbank and climbed up onto a small terrace through relatively open ground.
So this is my first samba dough down here in Australia. So I'm, I'm super excited about that. And I heard so much about that this is a very exciting hunt and I can really verify that. Because first you hear the dogs and it's, it's not like uh, just barking, it's like a singing sound you hear it up in the forest. So that kind of builds up the feeling and, uh, and the nerves. So that's uh, a, a great add to everything. It builds up the, the nerves, so you really are prepared when the animal comes. And uh, like in this case, when everything works out, it's, it's just perfect. You're super happy about it. News of Torbjorn's success travelled over the radio and everyone was thrilled. And with the hound pack now split and another deer being pursued, it looked like there was still more action coming our way. The hounds came tantalisingly close to Magnus and I, but again the deer moved away from our position, this time cutting high above us and turning to run back down the valley. Over in Eric's position, him and Sam could now hear the hounds rapidly coming their way and they had to move to quickly get higher and try and get in front of the deer. They did their best but the Samba was now in top speed trying to evade the hounds and it turned again and started back up the valley. No sooner than we'd heard the news over the radio from Sam, we started to hear the hounds. And this time, they were coming straight for us. Paul was adamant we stay put. Slightly uphill we heard movement and it was on. Magnus delivered a brilliant shot, under pressure and on the run. He was bang on target with one well placed shot to the vitals. And after such an exciting day, the sense of relief soon turned to joy. Congratulations, Magnus. You've got your first Thank you, Samba Rob. over the yeah. Bogues Hounds. Yeah, it's been a really great morning. We had uh, this beautiful spot. We had, we see the water underneath us. We've been hearing dogs and animals passing around us so many times. I would, between you and me, have started to give up on it. <laughs> yeah, a little bit frustrating, <laughs> exciting, but a little bit frustrating. Yeah, yeah. Paul worked his heart out trying to keep us in the same spot. And how many times do you reckon uh, the, the deer or the hounds have, have got, gone around us or got away from us today? Yeah, at least seven or eight. They've come very close, <laughs> quite a few times, frustratingly close. Your brother got lucky only maybe an hour or so earlier and we were yeah. happy with that, but this guy just topped it off. Yeah, well, a really a golden opportunity that came from nowhere. I was, to be honest, looking the other way. Uh, I don't know why I was just I got the feeling that somebody, something was coming from the other way. Mm. And uh, we turned around and th there she were. Um, and we got uh, what we call back home an aim point movement, where we got an animal on the run and yeah. uh, perfect distance. You just swing through it and shoot and it's what we yeah. use them for. Exactly. Fast moving target. Exactly. Quick target. The deer probably came in uh, in the lead up. You can see maybe 10 yards off us when it was on the run. Yeah, 10 meters. Ideal yeah. situation, which is very rare. It ran from the cover into the open and you got a beautiful, you know, leading shot on the run. You didn't panic. You actually let it come out and give you the proper shot. And Paul had been saying all morning, <laughs> imagine how good it would be if a deer just ran out in the open when we got cameras. Well, we need to thank Paul. Congratulations, yeah, mate. Thank, thank you, you again. Thank you. Yeah. Your family oh, has shooting. been, uh, yeah, four generations and your crew been working up here and your experience shows all the guys. There's so many unsung heroes in this hunt today and they're spread all over this valley and up around the systems and down blocking the road and they've worked tirelessly, your brother, all the other guys all weekend looking for sign. They've been tracking out, you know, valleys and gully heads trying to find fresh marks and keep the dogs moving. A successful hunt and what a you know, what a beautiful way to cap it off in the, in the state forest here in public land in Australia on a beautiful winter's day. Doesn't get much better than that. It sure doesn't. And these guys, the, uh, the dead set heroes of it all. <laughs> the afternoon had ended perfectly and everyone who was nearby pitched in to help with the task of walking out the dogs. And then we started on field dressing the deer and packing them out to the road before heading back to base camp. In another stroke of good luck, as evening approached, Paul took the guys for a flush hunt at a nearby hot spot and it all came together for Eric, who delivered a brilliant shot on the run to take a mature Sam behind. That evening there was certainly a lot to celebrate and be thankful for, especially the hard work and dedication put in by Paul, Adam, Sam and Les, not to mention each member of the Bogues hound crew. In the whole tradition of celebrating the hunt and the harvest, the Bogues family put on a huge spread for all involved, and for Magnus, Torbjorn and Eric, it was a brilliant end to the first stage of their Australian adventure. 
For the second leg of this adventure, we relocated the team from Melbourne at the southern end of the continent, three and a half thousand kilometres north, all the way to Darwin in the Northern Territory. We then started on the long drive east via dusty roads and across swollen rivers into the floodplain and escarpment country, home to one of the largest bovines in the world, the Asiatic water buffalo. Buffalo were introduced to the territory in the early 1800s and are now classified as a pest. While their numbers must be kept under control, they're considered by many to be a sustainable resource as the wild populations provide value through financial return to both farmers and traditional landowners via the meat trade, live export and hunting. A mature buffalo bull can weigh up to a ton. He's a formidable opponent and extremely tough to put down. The Northern Territory offers great hunting and along with the buffalo, it holds a small but very unique population of banteng, scrub bulls in some areas, magpie geese within season, scattered populations of deer and an abundance of feral pigs. Australia's premier top end outfitter is Carl Goodhand of Goodhand Outback Experience. Carl's huge hunting concessions are all free range and contain spectacular landscapes that can vary from floodplains and escarpments to remote sandy beaches. His luxury bush camps are expertly set up and provide amazing accommodation and beautiful food, right in the heart of productive hunting country. After getting picked up at Darwin, we made the long and dusty trek out to Buffalo Camp, where we'd be hunting with Carl and his experienced team for the next seven days. After the cold conditions and steep, thick terrain of the Victorian mountains, it would be a nice change to be out in the warm sun and mild weather of the top end in winter. With our first morning clear and fine, we were eager to get into it and headed straight for the range. I'm gonna run you through the gear that we're gonna be utilizing during this hunt. We are using the Saku rifle in different calibers and also the Tika rifles from 308 up to 450, depending on the game that we're gonna be hunting. We are also using the Saku and Tika ammunition. We have the aim point sights with us and the aim point sights is very qualified for these types of hunts because it's very tough and durable and it can stand up for the punishment, the going through the bush and other things. And the unique thing about the aim point is that you use two eyes open so you can be quick on the target and always focus on the game instead of focusing on a reticle. That means that you can see the game, place a red dot and get quickly into action and get that shot off, which is important when you hunt like we do in this type of environment. So before the hunt, you always want to make sure that the gun is zeroed, and especially after making the trip as we have done over bumpy roads, crossing uh, rivers and uh, all of that, you especially want to be sure that the gun is zeroed. Going after buffaloes and dangerous games is even more important. We have placed a target 50 meters over there, and we're going to see so the gun is zero. On this hunt for medium-sized games such as pigs, we'd be using the Ticker CTR in 308. For big game like buffalo, scrub bulls and bantang, we'd be using Sarko 85s in Classic, Hunter and Kodiak, all chambered in 375 H&H. Just to be sure, we'd also have the extra power of the Sarko Brown Bear in 450 Rigby. From the 308 right through to the 450, we'd be using premium Sarko ammunition. With the rifles now all zeroed, Magnus gave us a clear demonstration of the durability of aim point sights. Maybe I'm hunting dangerous game in Australia. Or maybe I'm just back home hunting wild boar with my son. The key to success is to always have equipment that you can trust and rely on. And my first choice is always aim point. And I'm about to show you why. <laughs> there you go, great. See how good it is? This is the first shot, and this is after a drop, like a centimeter apart. Gonna be better. With our rifles, ammo, sights, and gear all sorted, we were keen to get hunting. So we split up into two parties, with Eric joining guide Peter Mayo, and Torbjorn, Magnus, and I heading off to hunt with Carl. 
Our first priority was to find a buffalo, and Magnus got lucky drawing the first stalk. While it was now June and the start of the dry season, after one of the biggest and longest wet seasons on record, there was still groundwater in low-lying areas, and with the buffalo spread out due to the abundant feed, we would have to cover a lot of ground. Fires are often lit by the Aboriginals at the end of the wet season to burn off the long dry grass and the buffalo love to feed on any new growth. As we came through a recent burn, we got our first chance at a shot. Well done mate, first animal down. Thank you. Territory, it's a wild dog, yeah, it's a cross with a dingo. They come in, they're a real problem on these stations. They hit the cattle all the time and the guys are losing a lot of money. I mean, one one year alone on this property, they lost 3,000 calves to dingoes and wild dogs like this. So what we've done here, we've set up some baits. Yeah. And the first indication that was something on this bait was the tail end was taken out. So we, we did a good thing. We did a good thing. As we reached the valley floor, a small herd of buffalo was spotted, but it only held cows and the encounter was short-lived. We then spent hours driving and looking as the terrain changed from grasslands to rocky plateaus and shady forested creeks. It would be well into the afternoon before Carl finally spotted another small herd, this time with a good mature bull in amongst it. A stalk was quickly planned and we headed off through the long grass trying to close the gap and get in range for a shot at the bull. The buffalo were using the thick cover of a small creek to stay hidden and as we moved to keep up with the herd, the wind began to shift in behind us and we feared that at any second they would smell us and break away. As we made it into a small opening where we could get a clear view, the wind turned and they disappeared into the long grass. With the sun dropping fast, Magnus had one more chance before dark, and on a bull of this size, it was a chance we had to take. With a gentle breeze perfectly in our face, we pushed quietly and quickly to keep up with the bull, who was moving at a steady pace from right to left. On the edge of a rocky clearing, Carl decided we'd make our stand, and with the bull now somewhere in the thick scrub ahead of us, he began to cow call to try and bring him out into the open. The tactic worked perfectly and the huge bull began to slowly work his way towards us. The adrenaline started to pump hard as we stared face to face with him, now roughly 40 metres ahead. Carl kept up the calling and the seconds anxiously ticked past, waiting for a clear shot to present. Finally, his curiosity got the better of him and he stepped clear only 30 metres out. And for Magnus, it was the moment of truth. The bull was fatally hit in the first shot, but as is required with water buffalo, Magnus kept firing until the bull was stopped. With a final shot to finish him, emotions began to run high. Thank you, Thank you, well Thank you <laughs> That was hard work all day. All, all day, but it was so worth it in, in the end. And, uh, Beautiful old bull. Exactly what we were looking Beautiful for. Beautiful tracking of you. Was <laughs> great, and I, I hit him hard with the first shot. I was happy with that. Then yeah. I learned in, in, you know, in Africa, Australia. in Africa before that, on the buffalo, just keep on shooting. Yeah, so exactly right. So I just right. kept on firing, and I'm pretty sure I hit the first three ones pretty good. Yeah. But they are the big, big animals, big animals, big lungs, tough animals, and very, very tough. So I'm sorry if I give you a buzz <laughs> in the air for a few days now. <laughs> that should be alright. But this was uh, an experience to remember for a lifetime. It was something else. Excellent. As the sun sets behind us on the end of your first day in NT, it couldn't work out much better when you're sitting in behind a big water buffalo bull like this. Yeah, uh, I had a great day regardless, but to be honest, I didn't see this coming at all. We've been tracking and tracking and <laughs> trying and watching and looking. Haven't really seen any massive ones. Yeah, we've done some big miles today, so lots of bumping around and looking yeah. at Carl, and we've seen a few little ones. It's been been lucky. We've had a treat of a day to see those animals. We, we, uh, well, I uh, rephrase myself. We've seen a few good ones. Yeah. But uh, when we saw this one, there were, well, no no need to ask questions. This but I bet one. after being so close, that was an exciting stalk. You've been lucky to get in so close. Carl did a brilliant job calling him in, keeping him, you know, inquisitive. And uh, 
I bet you've got a whole new respect for you know our number one big game animal here in Australia. I have respect for all, all animals, but this is a very <laughs> yeah. beautiful animal, and they, they uh, just like I say, super tough. Well, this is what we're looking for in a water buffalo: mass, length, but you know, mass beat length anytime. This is a big, mature bull, heavy all the way out to the tips. So, congratulations, buddy. Thank you, Rob. So, I'm sitting next to this beautiful water buffalo that we're taking in Northern Territory, Australia. <clears throat> and maybe some people think that the aimpoint sites are only good for fast target shooting. Uh, but it's also really good in bushy terrain because you use the both eyes to spot the target and then you just lift up the rifle and you will find your target within that. And that's why you can make shots in difficult terrain so easy. <laughs> The previous day, Eric and Pete had looked over a lot of country searching for buffalo. They had done well and experienced some exciting but frustrating encounters with solid bulls where stalks were made on two separate occasions, but the cunning and elusive old bulls had managed to escape them each time. For their next hunt, Pete decided to move to a different part of the concession, and in the slightly open ground of a recent burn, caught a glimpse of a different animal they were after in a scrub bull which is an unwanted wild bull of domestic origins. Scrub bulls can be extremely dangerous and make for exciting hunting, and Eric was immediately at the ready. The guys put in a short, careful stalk, the bull began to move, and Eric picked his gap. The first shot was spot on, and the excellent follow-up shot hit the bull in the spine, putting it down for good. came here walking along this burnt, uh, yeah, burnt area and suddenly far far in the bush we saw a scrub bull. A scrub bull here in Australia is something that shouldn't be along with the other cattle and is considered a game to take. So we had a bit of a stalk because we had to get around him to get correct in the wind and then we stalked him upwards and then phew, yeah, everything prevailed. He was standing in a bush, took two steps out, I got the first round off in him. And then he started running, the first one hit well, and then I took the second round and he just dropped on that one about 10 meters away. So I'm really happy, that's my first scrub bull and I think I've done something good for Australia to help out with uh, taking down one of these animals. After a great start to the day, Eric and Pete set off again, searching for a mature buffalo bull. As they moved through some burnt ground onto a likely feed area, they spotted a trophy bull in the distance. A bull of this size was definitely worth pursuing, but with the buffalo on the move, they had to stalk fast but carefully to get within range. Walking around and above him, a small window presented and Eric took his chance. So we're just like wandering that, around yeah. and we came up the cliff here. Cutting Woo. off at the path. First shot and then I just took a repeat shot straight into the shoulder and it dropped. Both shots are probably sitting close together but it's thanks to the aim point I can reload so quickly. So not a great day here in the Northern Territory. Came down off a hill, down into a swamp area and on the other side we saw a big buffalo standing, this little boy. Unfortunately when we got down to the swamp the wind was starting to swirl and he got caught wind of us and he started walking alongside the swamp and getting away from us. So Pete the guy came up with a plan that we had to go around a little bit of a mountain, come from the top side down so we could cross his path because we knew the swamp was turning around. As luck prevails, when we got down there he came walking straight into us and quickly before he just, he just noticed us when we came down. I got off the first round and then quickly the second round and here is the buffalo of the day. About 60 kilometers away to the west, myself, Torbjorn, Magnus and Carl had also been putting in the time trying to find a scrub bull. The morning hadn't turned up much so in the afternoon as the day warmed up, Carl came up with the plan of trying to find a large billabong that he'd previously seen from the air. He reckoned it would be a likely place for a scrub bull to water in the heat of the day and was well worth a stalk. We pushed through the scrub in Carl's custom Land Cruiser, 
then started stalking towards the billabong. At the edge of the water, there was sign of both buffalo and cattle, but a strange noise alerted us, so we snuck in for a closer look. A large mob of wild pigs had moved in to feed on a carcass, and the strange sounds we'd heard were the squealing, grunting and biting coming from the pigs as they fought, trying to get their share. With the breeze in our face and the pigs focused entirely on the carcass and each other, we snuck into close range. Both Magnus and Torbjorn chose their targets, then it was on. When the dust settled, the sharpshooting Samuelson brothers had made an impressive tally. Magnus and Carl had also managed to catch up with a huge boar that tried to sneak away from the rest of the mob. The boar's weight was easily in the vicinity of 100 kilos, and he also sported an impressive set of tusks. Well, that was some awesome shooting and some good fun. The only bad thing about that was that I wasn't shooting. <laughs> I was very jealous. I'm a mad keen pig hunter myself, yeah. but from you guys from the Northern Hemisphere, being you know European boar specialists, welcome to Australia and our wild feral pig population, <laughs> which you've just made a big dent in. Thank you so much. Yeah. And this, uh, I mean, we hunt a lot of wild boars back yeah, home. Yeah, yeah. Basically what we do, but this is something completely different. Around the campfire at night, you know, we've been talking, it's been a real treat for me to hear about the European stories, you yeah. know, about how you uh, how you hunt the boar. But hey, this was a scrub bull hunt essentially, and Carl picked up on these pigs feeding on what turns out to be a pretty respective old bull that's just died of natural causes. The uh, the circle of life up here in the territory, and these pigs get stuck into it. You guys cleaned them all up. So I think we've got eight here, but some fantastic shooting with the aim points. You guys are certainly masters of the <laughs> both eyes open swing and shoot, and a bit unexpected, but hopefully we can find more of these. Yeah, we so. like that. <laughs> yeah, agreed, agreed. Yeah. Well, well done, fellas. For us, the encounter with the pigs was an exciting bonus. And combined with Eric and Pete's success on the buffalo and scrub bull, it had all made for a fantastic day's hunting. It's action stations on our second morning. The wind's up, but uh, another typical territory day. Nice and warm. We're heading down out of the wind to another spot. Your brother got lucky yesterday. Today, you're the lucky man on the rifle. How was your first day, your first experience of uh, hunting the top end yesterday? Uh, yesterday was a beautiful day because it was a nice build up for today. Yeah. And a nice ending with my brother getting his buffalo. Yep. And uh, I must say, if I was excited yesterday, I'm. I'm more excited today. Yeah, well now that's it. You've got the uh, the nerves are out. Um, you've you got a sh you shot a couple of uh, donkeys for pig bait, so you've got your rifle sighted in. You know where it's at. Yeah. Just fingers crossed. We can find a good bull today. But we're getting started a bit early, so we've probably got you know a good eight or nine hours of uh, driving and scouting. So hopefully something comes your way. Yeah, me too. <laughs> With the wind cooler than expected, Carl had picked out a distant valley for us to hunt. His knowledge of buffalo habits in the territory are second to none and he stressed the importance of using the weather to your favour, not working against it. This area in particular is a little different to most in terms of hunting buffalo. It's not a coastal type, type region. We hunt these valleys and it, at the head of these valleys are, are spring systems and the buffalo feed down along the spring systems. And because we're south of Darwin, it's a lot cooler than what it is on the coastal regions and um, the buffalo are more susceptible to the weather than what you might think. So on a cold, windy day like this, the buffalo do go to ground. Uh, you find them not typically where you would look for them. You'd find them up, held up in the trees and the bushes, 
and uh, you know, just milling about in the trees trying to get shelter from the wind because they feel the weather a whole lot more. By Darwin standards, this is cold. I think we're probably at around 22, 23 degrees and it's quite windy and dry. It's just that time of year. And with all the grass and water around, the buffalo really can be anywhere. As we started down from the head of the spring, Carl told us of a heavy old bull he'd seen nearby last season. And he seemed to think that he'd taken up residence in the area. Once down on the valley floor, we spotted a lone bull grazing off into cover, so moved in for a closer look. In an amazing stroke of luck, Carl was certain this was the bull he'd seen previously, so we started on a careful stalk to get the wind right and close the distance. Torbjorn knew exactly what was required and slowly and patiently closed the distance and waited for the perfect angle. The first shot was lethal, but an excellent follow-up shot on the run did the job, and the bull barely made it 10 metres before collapsing. <laughs> very, very good kill. Thank you. Well, some nice shooting there, Torbjorn. You're sitting in behind a big buffalo. Thank you, man. <laughs> that was an exciting little hunt, and Carl just gave us a hint of what we might have seen coming up to this spot. Yeah, that was super exciting because he said just before we went down that this is an area where I saw something last year, so I was thinking, okay. And then we just went down and whoa, it was there. <laughs> so yeah. that was. And he fed in this little creek, but that all worked out really well because we nearly lost him in the grass, but you were able to get in and get it done. Yeah, because he used actually walked up in the only gap that we had. So we have to make some quick decisions and uh, I mean, shooting-wise, the first one was kind of easy. Yeah. If you can't hit a bull on that distance, <laughs> then you should maybe do some other sport. I don't know which, Fair but enough, it's... Uh, that's very true. That's but very then true. again, it just turned, but I could still see it. And the second shot, I can place where I wanted it to go. Yep. And it basically just drops. As always, with any, with any big game, that high spine shot always drops them, and that's what you got on yourself. Yeah, and, and saying that, I mean, with the aim point, I mean, like the first shot you can do without anything on the gun. But doing the second shot is not really that easy to do. Yeah. But with the aim point, you can really see, oh, the gap is ending there, and uh, you can put the shot where you want. Well, the big 375's done the job. A buffalo down, your first Northern Territory buffalo. Congratulations. Thank you, super happy, super happy. The next morning, we were back on the hunt for scrub bulls, and Carl was keen to check out another large billabong where he'd seen three bulls only a few days earlier while scouting for buffalo. Before we got started on the stalk, he gave us an insight into their history throughout the region. Looking at the scrub bull in the Territory, um, the term scrub bull refers to the European shorthorn cattle, and they're the remnants of the older cattle industry that's now changed. Now it's changed due to the fact that you know meat and, and taste has changed overseas, and it's a lot easier to sell you know, a certain colour of cattle if they're all the same. Uh, the scrub bull, the European shorthorn, has been bred out a lot in most areas, but this is one of the areas where you'll find and hunt. And we're only hunting the purebred bulls. Yep. Um, they exhibit, you know, traits that are that are quite recognisable, like the white patch around the eye, the rough forehead. Mm -hmm. You know, it's um, white horn and red skin. So it's it's like um, they're they're distinguishable very easily when you see them, and they really are one of the top most dangerous bovines up here. Oh, yeah, they're definitely, there's, there's no uh, denying the excitement to hunting these guys is their, is their size, their tenacity, and their, you know, anger and distaste for people trying to shoot them. Absolutely, <laughs> like for a long time, these cattle have eluded a capture, you yeah. know, for a long time. They've never been put through a yard, never, you know, fought dingoes, everything to get where they are. And often you'll find with the shredded, shredded ears from dingoes, fighting other cattle, you know, and just, 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 you know, just mean old things. Yeah, know? right, grumpy. So the desirable cattle here on this station are Brahmins, being the whites. Uh -huh. You said the mixed breeds are still worth more alive than dead. That's right. But the the pure old form of the of the shorthorn, the red skin, as you call it, European shorthorn bulls. Yep, that's what we're looking for. Now, give us a heads up on the scenario that you've done a bit of scouting previously. Yeah, and you reckon a couple of days ago we came into this spot 
and uh, there was three or four good bulls just in one area and a heap of cows and they were all purebred shorthorn. Mm -hmm. Um, we can hear them bellowing in the background. The wind's not perfect, it's sort of swirling, as you can see, but we'll, we'll just play the odds and yep. hopefully we'll run into some good bulls and good we'll, we'll see what's out there. It was obvious from the well-worn game trails heading towards the water that cattle were regularly using this billabong. As we neared the edge, Carl spotted dark shapes further around and through the binos we could see some smaller mobs of cattle. The wind wasn't ideal, but it was still worth a chance, so we began to stalk closer, keeping a safe distance from the water, as this was ideal crocodile habitat. As we stalked slowly around the billabong, again Carl's keen eyes picked up movement, and in the grass up ahead, he spotted a scrub bull in with some other cattle that were bedded in the shade. The cagey bull got edgy and led the cattle to break cover. As they came into view, Carl pointed out the troublemaker and Magnus swung the aim point into action. Good shooting again, mate. Things are cool. Bulls down, and you can see the rough hair on the forehead. Yeah. The characteristic curved horns. And you can see, like I was just saying before, this is from dingoes. When they're young, tearing on their ears. Oh. They live a hard life out here, so. He's the oldest one of the group. You see his friends didn't really want to leave him. Sure, they're going to feel our wind, but the wind is swirling back it and forth back all directions. Forward, yeah. Absolutely. I can't believe the size of it. It's a really massive beast. Now. They are, aren't they? They can do some real damage with these things. Yeah, big respect for it. It's a massive animal and I can't really see how they can make it out here in this dry oh. environment and all that, but... Old Scrabble, you can see a bit of grey through his head here. Hair's starting to grey out like ours. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm past that. I'm... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, excellent trophy. Big bull, good set of horns on him. Uh, couldn't be happier. Really pleased. Later that afternoon, Torbjorn was still searching hard for a scrub bull, and finally in the fading light, a large bull was spotted and he stalked into range with the 450 Rigby. The first shot was a solid hit, and the excellent follow-up dropped him instantly. Well done, mate. Thank you. Thank He's you. down. As Pete, as Pete said, you guys are red hot on your backup shot. Yeah, that's uh, especially on this kind of game. I learned that it's, even if you think that the first shot is good, it's always good to do the second yeah, one. Yeah, so often needed on big guys like this. Yeah. Oh, you've uh, you finished up your all your your tags. You tagged out all your Swedes. You've done well. Let's go and check them out. Yeah, let's do it. With each of the guys now having successfully hunted a quality buffalo and scrub bull, we still had one more bovine species to hunt. But for this one, we'd have to relocate to another of Carl's remote concessions. Without doubt, one of the big draw cards of the Northern Territory for hunters is the elusive Banteng bull. One of the rarest bovines in the world, the Bantang was introduced to Australia and the top end boasts the only huntable population on the planet. Magnus, Pete and I set off north of camp to try and track one down and in the heat and dry of the Territory Savannah, our expert guide Peter located a small herd holding in cover with a solid dominant bull. A careful stalk was planned and we made our way closer to the herd that was sheltering in the shade of a stand of trees. As Bantang bulls mature, their coat turns black and we had our eyes firmly on a big black bull that was now hidden amongst cover. challenging stalk got us within range and after patiently waiting him out, Magnus was finally presented with a clear shot. Well 
up, Magnus? Beautiful <laughs> shooting. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> I wish everyone could shoot like you. <laughs> Beautiful bull. Yeah, it's, it's one of those animals you don't really want to miss. No. He no. was coming straight away. As <laughs> soon as he saw us, like yeah, he, yeah, yeah. he wasn't That's running cool. away, he was running out. The final stage of our hunt in the Northern Territory had arrived and it was something we'd been looking forward to all week. After such a big wet season and with an abundance of good feed on the grazing leases nearby, feral pigs were prolific and spread out right through the region. We'd hired an experienced local helicopter pilot and after loading into his four-seat Robinson 44, we took to the sky to try and track down the highly mobile mobs of destructive feral pigs. What do you reckon of the country from the air, Magnus? Looks a bit different, eh? Looks awesome from up here. It's really, really beautiful. Whoa, check this out. That is spectacular. You know, we've been stalking this country for buffalo and scrub bull for, you know, three, four days now. But, you know, we've only ever seen a couple of pigs and it's amazing how much difference it makes in this long grass after the wet to get up and uh, get see it from the air and get that perfect visibility down through the trees to pick up these big black pigs. Our pilot spotted a decent mob of pigs bedded under the shade of a tree and pitched in to drop us off downwind so we could stalk in on them. As we quietly worked our way towards where we'd last seen them, the breeze started to swirl and when we reached the large tree, all but one of the pigs had moved off. A solid boar was still bedded and Eric challenged him to get to his feet and dared him to make his escape. At the sound of the shot, a large boar broke cover and started to move off. Eric locked onto him and a great shot had him down. The swirling breeze now started to work in our favour and the original mob that had previously moved off started to work back towards us. We held still as they got closer, then Magnus and Eric got to work. As the rest of the mob broke away through the long grass, our pilot kept a check on the pigs and managed to turn them back around. Eric and Magnus reloaded, stalked up into position and got set to go again. Magnus finished off the session with two pigs from two clean shots. As our pilot flew back in to pick us up, we got a strong smell of carrion and found a heavily eaten buffalo carcass nearby. Depending on their appetite, feral pigs will eat almost anything. And this was clearly the reason why there was so many holding in the area. After another stint in the air, we looked over a lot of ground, but the pigs in this area were proving hard to find. We did spot a lone boar walking the edge of a billabong, so with not much else around, decided to give it a shot. That was a good sized boar, definitely one worth hunting. 
pilot's working hard here. It's getting close. I don't think he's far away. Magnus had waited patiently, then delivered a great clean shot to finish up the session. Thanks, mate. This is one of the coolest things I've ever done, I think. <laughs> the pilot then returned to camp to swap out the shooters, and now Torbjorn and I finally had our chance to get in on the action. It didn't take us long to find pigs, but after we landed, they split up. A solo pig did come our way, so we patiently held still and Torbjorn made clean work of him. Behind us, the chopper pilot had managed to find the pigs again, holding in the heavy cover. He finally got them to flush our way and we picked our targets as they moved across the open ground. Smoking hot barrels, mate. Yeah, that's what's uh, intense. <laughs> <laughs> intense to say the least, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, you haven't seen anything like that back home in Sweden, have no, you? No, uh, definitely haven't. We've got a big boar over here. Let's yeah. go and check him out. I think you got this, guys, as the first shot, yeah, wasn't it? Sure. Torbjorn's got eyes for a big boar here. That's a, that's a good territory pig, mate. It was time to get moving again, and so we got back into the air and started searching for more pigs. The pilot soon spotted a mob bedded in along a dry sandy creek, and with the wind right, he found the clearing to set us down so we could work out a plan. Gonna stalk in on this mob this time. There's about uh, maybe 10, a dozen pigs bedded in the sand under a pandanus tree. So we'll take a slightly softer, quieter approach, see if we can stalk in and get them real close and put them up out of their beds. As we moved along the creek bed, the damage done by the pigs as they fed and rooted up the ground could be seen everywhere. Up ahead, we spotted the stand of pandanus where the pigs were bedded, but the swirling breeze started to come in behind us. And just as we were setting up for the final stalk, the pigs smelled us and started to spook. We just got Tipped at the post then, those pigs got onto us just as we crept up, but we still managed three on the run. Still a good result, still a bit of light left and still a bit of fuel left in the chopper. Right, we've dropped in on three boars here. This isn't your typical mobs of pigs. Big guys on their own like to break away, as this guy is doing here. The boars had now separated and Torbjorn and I moved to set up on the edge of the dry creek bank where we had a clear shot.
single large boar appeared, and just as we were ready, he moved down into the creek and was then joined by a second large boar. The two pigs started to get angry and began to tussle and fight in the creek bed. These were both great sized boars and we wanted both of them, but trying to get a clear shot at the two of them was the hard part. The pigs became more aggressive and when they finally cleared the bank, they spotted us so we fired. Both pigs were hit hard, but instantly one charged. Torbjorn's excellent shot put him down just metres from reaching us. With the other pig dispatched, we now had two more solid Northern Territory boars to add to the final tally. Well, that's a pretty solid way to round out the day. Pretty exciting. Yeah, it's, it's hard to do with it in a more exciting way. Yeah. <laughs> it's almost yeah. too fin much. Finishing up with a full frontal charge from this boar. Yeah. I'm glad to say Torborn was here because I was nowhere near that, <laughs> near that charge. I just made him angrier, I think. <laughs> but you stopped him right where he needed to, straight yeah. in the brain. Two big boars. What an epic way to finish a pretty manic afternoon. You know, two, three hours has flown by, it's flown by fast yeah, like that. It's been a very exciting afternoon. <laughs> it has, it has. And this wraps up our, uh, our leg of this hunt. I think you've had a pretty good taste of what the Northern Territory can dish up. Yeah, and I mean, for me, this is my first time in Australia at all. And I mean, hunting here, when you think of it, you don't really know what to think of to hunt. Yes. And you have so much to hunt and you have so much of it. Well, I'm glad you got up in the air at the end of the hunt. You know, because uh, if you'd flown around a helicopter at the start and then gone, you know, to ground and yeah. had to stalk through all this, you'd be going, God, it looked easier from the air. But, <laughs> yeah. you know, on a beautiful afternoon at sunset, you've had, uh, you know, a great flight and a lap around this beautiful escarpment country. You can see what it can offer. And you guys, you know, a wild boar specialist, this is, this is your absolute niche. So I'm glad we've shown you, you know, how the Australians do it or how we can do it. It's been a treat for me. And uh, hopefully we might be able to get you out here one day again, you and your brother and Eric. I promise I'm you sure will. it won't take much convincing. <laughs> no, no, it's really easy. <laughs>